Welcome back to Forbidden Knowledge News. I'm your host, Chris Matthew. Today I want to welcome back to the show Matt LaCroix. He is an author and researcher, grew up exploring outdoors of northern New England. After college, he began studying ancient civilizations, philosophy, quantum mechanics, and history. His focus became uncovering and connecting the esoteric teachings from secret societies and ancient cultures that disappeared long ago. He also works as a writer and researcher at Gaia and has appeared on shows such as Ancient Civilizations, The Unexplained, and Mystery School of Truth. Matt, welcome back. How you doing? I'm doing great, Chris. It's always an, an awesome conversation sitting down and talking to you about these mysteries of our past. Oh, yes, and I'm super excited for today. We're going to once again make history. This is new groundbreaking information that you've uncovered. You've been mapping out artifacts and evidence of a connection from the ancient Sumerians and Anuna to Atlantis in a timeline of events as well as a possibility of an undiscovered advanced civilization. Now, this is going to be amazing. Now, before we get into any of this, for the audience that might not be familiar, just tell us about yourself and your work. Yeah, I know. That was like a mouthful, what we're about to share. Uh, and I, that was, those are great comments, Chris. I want to just echo that. Um, when I get excited about something, it's usually for a reason. Um, and in this case... I think this is this work is going to be up there with the work I'm doing with um, binary star and, and catastrophes, as well as Eridu and the eagle and the serpent in, in a lot of those areas that I've put into some of my niche of study. Um, and this is going to be one of those ones that's added to it. And I want it to be one of the focuses of the new book I'm writing in conjunction with Earth catastrophes and discussing this binary companion, but discovering these this new lost civilization I'm about to present and how it connects with this entire story of Sumer and Atlantis and how the entire ancient world came together. So I'm excited to sit down, Chris, and to answer your question. Again, yeah, for those who don't know me, I am a very eager um, author and researcher who has made it my mission, I guess, in life to uncover the ancient secrets of our past, where we come from, but in a way that empowers us, taking all of these ancient tablets and mysteries and stories about where we came from and who we really are and how the entire thing lays out in a timeline and in a way to understand when things happened and when the rise and fall of civilizations occurred and if our entire history is dramatically different than we've been taught in school. So that's why today, Chris, we're going to rewrite history. I love it, man. I love it. And the more I learn from wonderful researchers like yourself, the more history becomes dramatically different than what we've learned from academia and our modern history books and much older as well. So I'm very much looking forward to getting into this. Where should we start with this today, Matt? Well, I guess we'll start with a pretty comprehensive presentation I put together for this. And for those who want to see how serious I am, this represents about six months of work. So this isn't just something I threw together last minute. Um, it's a very s significant body of study and evidence that I've put together, which I believe is provides concrete evidence to connect something that I don't, as far as I'm aware of, no one's provided a direct connection of in terms of archaeological evidence and new sites. I want everyone to wrap their heads around the idea that what I'm about to show you is both some ancient knowledge as well as brand new discoveries. Most of these are less than 10 years old. Some of them are less than five years old. Talk about cutting edge stuff. Mm. Thankfully, because of technology and the ability to be on the ground seeing these things firsthand and photos just being uploaded, you know, from a week ago, in some cases, we are able to see what's going on right now in the most, what I consider the most exciting new discoveries that have been made in the last 20 years. You know, move Gobekli Tepe aside for a minute and get ready for what I, we're about to present here. Now, these are all real images. Everything I have in here is directly related to what I'm about to present. It's not something that Oh, this looks good, but hey, by the way, it's from across the world. It doesn't, it's not relevant here. Th these are all taken from very specific on these ancient sites. And we're going to connect a story that I don't believe has ever been connected. 
the lost connection of our ancient past with the, the Sumerians leading up to the ancient Babylonians and the ancient Egyptians and the Atlanteans and how the entire Asia Minor, Europe, as well as the Mediterranean Basin played a role in this entire story. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to connect dots and we're going to connect something that I think is honestly going to blow people's minds. So here we go, Chris. You ready? I am ready. Can't wait, man. Okay. Now, I'm not going to be able to just spend an enormous amount of time on topics that I've already extensively discussed. Mm -hmm. You know, for those who are getting into this that don't know a lot about the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian pantheons of gods, talking about how, you know, you have Enlil and then Elil in Assyria is the same person with different spelling names. Uh, for you know, forgive me if we go t a little bit too fast on some of these areas, but I do have a very large wealth of videos on a library on my channel, Matthew Lacroix, that I have a lot of this, these discussions and conversations to expand on this. So we're not going to be able to do a lot of that today. We're going to have to just sort of jump forward. But let me just briefly give a, a tiny introduction for those who don't know a lot of this. Okay. So according to the oldest stories we have on in, in mankind, and I mean, anyone can argue that, you know, some people might argue the Vedic texts are older, but truthfully, how could they be? Because paper is, is it's well been studied and, and discussed in ancient text is only 500 to 1000 year, years old at a max. We know paper can't last longer than that. So the only way to truly preserve a message that can that can stand the test of time is through ancient stone and clay. And that's exactly what the Sumerians understood. They mastered something that then would would uh, branch out and it was called cuneiform writing. It would branch out to not only the Sumerians, but the later Babylonians, Assyrians, um, Akkadians, as well as up into the Hittite region and Turkey and a lot of those areas. But it all began in Sumer. And I do agree with that, but I don't agree with when. And that's, we're going to branch off from what we exist, the existing knowledge of what we talk about extensively, a lot of the individuals in my field, and we're going to move into these new areas. So all according to the ancient tablets, whether it's something like Eridu Genesis or Atrahasis, we find out that Eridu was the first city ever created on earth. Not simply something where nomadic hunter gatherers came together but a divine lowering of kingship where it's stated that it was created in a very specific location and that the river er, euphrates river was designed and channeled by the ajiji to possibly be an exact representation of the eridanus constellation again the connection between heaven on earth that bridge the law of correspondence that's what we're we have to focus on here as we as we expand out to understand this story so according to them, they build the first city, Eridu, and then they continue and they build other magnificent ancient, ancient cities, with the last of them being what's called Shurupak. Now, in the ancient tablets, Shurupak is supposedly the last of these ancient, ancient cities before a catastrophe comes through and essentially wipes out the old world. Now, I want to briefly go back really quick where I have all these question marks. We know the similarities of the gods in Sumer and the similarities of other civilizations that rise, such as Atlantis, with the sons of Atlas and connections with Poseidon. We know the similarities there are very, very closely tied with Sumer because we know it's the same gods. And we know that the same this is simply Enlil from Sumer. But how does the whole thing connect? How does Sumer possibly connect to Atlantis? That's where this is going to get fascinating. Mm. Now, so according to our mainstream academia as of now, what is the accepted age of Sumer and the Sumerian civilization as of now? Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's good to establish that. If you were to, say, go into ancient history and you're learning about it, whether it's in high school or college, you're going to be taught that the ancient Sumerians in Mesopotamia arose 6,000 years ago in that area of the Fertile Crescent and then had this linear growth that then led to like the Egyptians and then later, you know, the Greeks and eventually up to our, our narrative. But the problem is that that window, that 6,000 year window is, is, an, is an old number that's more based on ancient religion. It's this idea of creation in that, in that time period. So what they did is they almost mixed in the monotheistic, monotheistic Christian religions with this idea that, that the earth is only like 7,000 years old or all these things. 
And they mixed it in with this very, very primitive mindset of civilizations being just gradual and linear. And that's where the issues come in is that throughout, you know, the last, let's say, 80 years to 100 years, there have been a lot of archaeologists that have come along that are completely challenging that narrative. What we're seeing is that it's instead of civilization arising only 6,000 years ago in Sumer, it looks like civilization may have arose in Sumer more than 50,000 years ago. And that's what, and I have a timeline woven into this presentation to not totally boggle people's minds here. But what we have to do is instead of separating out and saying, well, look, it's not just a 6,000 year timeline. Let's say it's a 13,000 year timeline to include the ice age or whatever, two civilizations. No, wipe that one clean too. How about three or four civilizations, three or four rises that have risen up been destroyed and have risen up and eventually had lost the influence of some of these patron gods of Sumer and became more primitive and had to start over again. But what about that entire period of rises and falls? That's where this archaeological evidence is going to blow that entire narrative open, as well as discussing bloodlines. Hmm. So you ready, Chris? I'm ready. So in these, these two tablets you have in front of you, are some of the most popular and famous of the of the two sets of cuneiform tablets from ancient Sumer and Assyria. And what you have is the Atrahasis, which is a, a set of tablets that was found in Nineveh in 1849. Now, that was important because they then also found the Epic of Gilgamesh, which had the same stories woven, but over the course of separating itself by thousands of years. And what that, why that's important is that we can take these stories and the similarities and the things that they say in them and literally recreate the ancient world. But that's not enough. It only gets us so far. What about the actual evidence and proof that this is real? That's what's so exciting about this is that we're about to take what is considered still largely myth, even in some sectors of our groups, and realize that most of it is not myth. Mm. So in the Atrahasis, you learn that the this is written from the story of the biblical Noah character. And I want that to be so clear because I feel like it gets lost. The Noah character in Genesis and in, in the Christian text was originally not called Noah at all. And in fact, that story became turned into kind of a silly tale. It's, I want we, us to just sort of strip most of it away, except for a couple key things. Where he landed, the core of his family, and bringing some with him, that was absolutely true. And the reason that we know that is because of these tablets. Now, these tablets are at a minimum 10,000 years older than Genesis in the Christian text. I just want to get that out there. At least, not just a thousand years old, at least 10,000 years old. So all those stories, they come from here. They're ancient Mesopotamian stories. And what they state is that this last great city that was created by these Anuna patron gods of Sumer, known as Sherupak, was ruled by a king known as Ubara Tutu, and he had a son who became the figure known as Noah. Now, his son rose up to power to be a great man, and his name was Umtanapishtim, or in the Epic of Gilgamesh, he's called Zayasudra. So, in the tablet on the left, Hadrahasis, he's called Umtanapishtim, and then in the other tablet, he's called Zayasudra. It's important to understand that because we get into the names that can be confusing. But what both stories tell is that this ancient king, the last king, we'll call him the last great king of this first civilization of Sumer that arose, he was warned about this coming catastrophe by his patron god Enki. Because Enki had stated that he was this top bloodline that was directly down from the gods. And the reason that's important is we're, we're not even going to get close to talking about race today. I don't even want to approach that. All humans are amazing. What we're talking about are genetic gifts because of bloodlines mm -hmm. that come from ancient Sumer. Now, in the stories, Enlil Enki, Enki warns Untanapishtim Noah that this catastrophe is coming and tells him he has to build a specific kind of craft to survive. And he tells him about bitumen, which is funny because bitumen we still use today in construction and building. And back then, the ancient times, they knew it was, it was about mixing certain key elements to create like almost like a glue-like, very, very, very tough type of material to bind things. So he's told to create this craft to survive a coming catastrophes. And he, he repeatedly tells him that he needs to create a roof 
that is so tough that it's like the, the ceiling of the abzu, like the underworld. In order, in, 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 basically, what he's they're saying is you're going to have things coming from above. You're going to have water. You're going to have like it's like the end of the world, and you have to build this craft that can survive it. Now, by craft, did he mean seagoing craft or yes. okay? Well, th- and that's what I'm going to be very careful of. We want to look at. I know some people be like, "How do you know?" Well, it describes it as needing to float on water, uh-huh. and it describes it as needing to get through a deluge. So we know that it's yeah. it's that. OK, um, at this point in time, we don't see any high level of sophistication for technology that I'm aware of. And I want to make that clear. Mm-hmm. We see a high level of knowledge, but we don't see a high level of building yet. In fact, what we see is the opposite. And the, the Sumerians and the ancient Anuna preferred brick. Brick doesn't last a long time, though. It's unfortunate. But they preferred brick because of the elements and the different things. But that changes as we go along. Anyway, let's continue because I don't want to get lost here mm-hmm. is that in this flood story the Utanapishtim this this last great king of a bloodline the flood comes and literally destroys everything it destroys the, the entire old world and it's described that he takes his entire family all of his family he's got three sons he's got a wife and he's got he takes they take some animals because they have to eat and all these different things they don't take two of every kind though they just take what they can and the catastrophe comes through and it wipes everything out. And it it, it talks about how he's floating across endless oceans. Remember, he sends the dove out and then it eventually doesn't come back. That's from Genesis. That's true. And, wh- and where he lands, where he lands is all this turned into a myth, right? He lands on Mount Ararat and the whole thing. Well, let's take a take a moment and pause there for a second. Just pause there for a minute. What if it's true? What if the whole thing is true? But not not from the Genesis perspective, but from the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian perspective. Now, and this is where we're going to get to it. The first place to start is that Eridu in those stories, in all the stories, whether it's myth of Dapa, Eridu, Genesis, Atrahasis, it doesn't matter what it is. It's always talked about as being the first city ever created. But all most biblical scholars and all archaeologists had considered those stories merely myths, that none of it was real. And then here we come, 19, the late 1800s into 1946, Oxford University in the in Iraqi museum, they find Eridu. Oops, guess what? It's not a myth anymore. This was a real place. This was the first city ever created. And of course, I have an entire campaign and lots of videos talking about Eridu, so I'm not going to do that today. But I just want to point out, here's myth number one that wasn't supposed to be real, and it is real. Myth number two, Shurupak. The last of the cities of the pre-Diluvian cities where Obar Tutu ruled and then his son, Noah, Untinapishtim, that wrote the whole story. Was it real? Yes, it is. Here's Shurupak, uncovered in Iraq in 1931. And so it's a real place. And what was more important, look at the picture here. They had to dig through, in some cases, 30 to 50 feet of soil to get to the ruins, meaning that they had been flooded just like Eridu, by a massive amount of mud and 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 debris on these sites, mm. exactly like they're described. And, and, they, and furthermore, what was fascinating is they did done studies in the last 30 years to 40 years where they have gone to these sites and they've been like, wait, is the Genesis myth of a flood true? And they actually did studies where they looked at that first 30 to 50 feet because they thought there had to be another occupation in there. And there had to have been other things going on. It can't really be a true story of a flood, right? What they found is that largely between this 30 feet to 50 feet, which is enormous, by the way, of of a material, they found nothing. Human, No human tools, nothing. Means it was truly a massive amount of debris that just piled on top of these places, Mm. burying them and sealing their fates for thousands of years. So there's myth number two. All these ancient cities were real. So now let's keep going. Let's break all these myths and connect it. Now, can I ask you something real quick? You said that Babylonian, the Sumerian civilizations were the first civilizations. Could it be possible that there were older civilizations that had some sort of been subjected to a major cataclysm that have been wiped out before that? Well, that's the thing is they clearly state that they were the first. Like Mm. it's, it's very, very well stated that Eridu and the civilizations of Sumer 
were the was a first place that it all began. But the time period is huge. That's the thing we got to wrap our head around is that in between there, there have been many, many other civilizations and some that have reached again, like Atlantis. And that's where is it and that the actual Sumerian, Babylonian, Akkadian region region, like there's a there's what's called an old Babylon, the Neo Babylon, and then a later Babylon. They use the same sites over and over again all over the world. That's the problem that's is that we see a recycling of the same places because the other cultures knew that they were important. They knew that at one time, and I want to break this down so people understand this is important. Why are they building all these temples? Why are they building these specific sites? Why are they doing all this in a specific way? Well, my research is uncovered and it gets into this term Nibiru. I want to clear this whole thing up. It's this understanding of, remember, a bridge between heaven on earth. We know that the Orion, three belt stars of Orion, is the is being mimicked on the in the Giza plateau with the three three great pyramids, right? We know that they're mimicking the stars for an energetic purpose. The same thing is happening though across the world at Teotihuacan. Those the this temple of the the, the moon, the sun, and the Quetzal, temple of Quetzalcoatl. It's the same thing. It's aligned to the three belt stars of Orion all around the world. Like in Eridanus, with the Eridanus aligning to the pre-Diluvian cities of Sumer, we see this obsession in the ancient world with not only mapping and connecting the heavens, heaven like heaven on earth, and bridging this gap, but also creating temples that were literally the bridge between heaven on earth. So they would create temples in a very specific place. Like for instance, in the ancient world, there was a uh, there was an ancient city near Mosul that was. Uh, basically a patron city to Enlil. And he had a temple there, the temple of Enlil and the temple of Nibiru. Okay. That's where the, the term Nibiru first came from. It came from a term called the temple of Nibiru. And it was a temple dedicated to Enlil. And if you look up the term Nibiru, it actually is termed the crossing. What about the crossing of heaven on earth? The bridge, the bridge between the higher realms and the lower realms is the crossing. And it seems like there's an obsession with temples all around around the world built for that very purpose. The purpose of these emissaries, these great de demigod kings, were going there and that was where they were meeting and communicating. Where, where laws were handed down, rules, where governing and advice, it was these places. And that was what their obsession was. And I want to make that clear because as we go forward, we're going to see those themes come up over and over and over again. Okay. Does that make sense, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Now, here's Mount Ararat. It's one of, if not the most prominent mountain on earth. It's an incredible mountain. It's like, it's like top three most prominent mountains on earth. It's a massive stratified volcano that's largely dormant now, but it's so big. It's over 16,000 feet tall. It's so big that it just dominates everything as far as you can go. If you were to try to find the next largest mountain besides Mount Ararat, you have to go to the Himalayas. And why that's important is that in these descriptions, it states that this was the only land that was above water during these catastrophes. How could that happen? Not rain. Wrap your head around the idea of like crustal displacement and plates moving and massive tsunamis and tectonic shifts with water just cycling around the world because everything's everything's being um being adjusted mm. now in the story though you gotta go gotta connect to it he lands here what happens in the atrahasis as we continue the stories of this of the atrahasis here is that he he survives with his family and enlil and enki come down from heaven from the higher realms and they, they, Enlil's furious. They had created this catastrophe. They wanted to wipe out all of humanity. And he and his bloodline sons directly genetically connected to Enki, these gifts of the Anuna, right? That's, imp that's incredibly important for this, to understand that that's what these inherent gifts are within us. These telekinesis gifts and these powerful gifts as creators, it came from that. And that's why... His the bloodline that we're about to talk about and the archaeological evidence is so important because it directly leads into Sumer and even Lemuria Mu, in my opinion. So in, in this description, Chris, he supposedly lands on there and en Enlo comes down furious. There was not to, supposed to be any mortal men. Mankind was not supposed to survive. That doesn't mean there weren't other humans that survived, obviously, but I think it was more like this divine bloodline wasn't supposed to survive. 
Mm. And what happens is uh, Enki says, well, I, I saved him because he's my bloodline and you decided to create a catastrophe, blah, blah, blah. And ultimately they come up with an agreement. In the death of Bill Games, Bill Games is another name for Gilgamesh, you find out that there was an agreement made where this king, Noah, Untanapishtim, was the last man ever given immortality, ever. That's what they state. He was the last man ever given immortality. And subsequently, he sort of disappeared from our realm. And that's such a weird thing to think about, but his sons didn't. And the reason we know that in terms of him disappearing is that Gilgamesh ends up meeting him on a journey. Remember, he meets him on this journey into the underworld and he finds him in the underworld, which means, by the way, the trick in terms of immortality, you can't be a physical being here in the third realm. That's mm. your trick. You want to be, you exist internally in the underworld forever. That's what happened. He's in this other realm. Gilgamesh goes on a spiritual journey. It's not a real thing. He goes on this out of body journey and he goes and he meets him on this journey and he tell and and he proceeds to tell Gilgamesh of an ancient story right i love this where he tells him that Shurupak is far older than he ever know than he's ever aware of that it's way before him and Gilgamesh is an ancient king and but what he tells him is that basically you can't achieve immortality and then Gilgamesh ends up going home like empty handed but the point of that is we know what happens to this character that's what's so fascinating. We know that. And we also know that Gilgamesh meets Atana, who is the first king of the new world after these catastrophes go through. It states that Kish is relowered in ancient Sumer. So that's there are, there's some things going on in Sumer, but there's other things going on too. And that's where this gets interesting. Right. Now, Chris, I want to blow this whole thing open because this is where it gets fascinating. In Eastern Turkey, next to Mount Ararat, I have been doing a lot of research and doing a lot of digging to try to see if I can connect a theory I had, again, with the sons and bloodlines of that Noah character, creating an entire lost civilization that eventually led to, to the rise of Atlantis. Again, remember, he's a Sumerian king. His sons are ancient Sumerian bloodlines from this. So what did I discover? I believe this is what is, is the most cutting edge part of this, that I want to try to explain and present the fact that I don't believe anyone has ever connected this or presented it. So it's very exciting. And what happened was I stumbled across Zernaki Tepe about six months ago. Zernaki Tepe is in the northern part of what's called Lake Vaughan. Lake Vaughan is the largest lake in Turkey, and it's one of the oldest lakes in the world. It's an ancient, ancient lake that was around way before the Ice Age in eastern Turkey that's just west of Lake er of Mount Ararat. Okay. I just started getting curious about Zernaki Tepe quite a while back because I had found, well, look, it just got discovered. They were starting to uncover it and they were getting some, some interesting mysteries out of it. Some big, cun some cuneiform writing and some big megalithic blocks in ancient Kings lists. So I started going on this crusade around Lake Vaughn to, to prove a theory I had about a lost civilization that wasn't known as the Eurasians. That's what they're, just like the Hittites are not really the civilization of Anatolia. They're a later civilization that came. These are not the Eurasian civilization. This is what's known as the Mount Ararat civilization. Brand new civilization that I believe is the second iteration of, of civilization here. When civilization began to uprise to another level that then led to Atlantis. And you can see that because we can follow the technological sophistication at this site. So I want to point out some information here so we can see this. Look at the names of the locations on here because we're about to break them down and show you pictures. Right. In the north on Lake Vaughn is Zernaki Tepe. Just discovered, less than 5% excavated. Incredible place. To the south of it is Cavus Tepe that most people have never even heard of. That site contains what I would consider the finest megalithic stones anywhere outside of Egypt and Peru. That should pique people's interest right there. And we're even going to follow back to that connection with Egypt and Peru after. And then to the west here on Lake Vaughn, we see a place called Kef Kalesi that I don't believe anybody's talked about <laughs> because I, I found it by accident. And it's not even been, it's been zero excavated. And it's, I only have a couple, there's only a couple photos that even exist of it. 
What this totality represents are three major archaeological sites that present what I call the new civilization that hasn't been uncovered called the Mount Ararat civilization, which I believe was the offshoot of the Sumerians that had then led to Atlantis. Now let's get into it. Yeah. So you're saying that this civilization wasn't ad advanced as Atlantis as it, ad at its pinnacle, but was on the upswing from the Sumerian civilization. None of these civilizations were remaining independent with their patron influences. What I mean is when a civilization was created, the primary influences of those civilizations often moved on. So mm. they would create this. They're the sons of Untanapishtim would rule there. But the, the ingeniousness and the knowledge, because we know that Sumer, the knowledge of everything in our reality came out of nowhere. We know that the Sumerians invented, we know they invented mathematics, writing, agriculture, metallurgy, animal husbandry, agriculture, astronomy. Jeez, I could go on and on and on. Mm. Everything. Where did it come from? Well, they say it was, it was handed down to them from above. It was like they wanted, there was blueprints for a civilization to be created, and that's what kingship was. Same thing here, but the next iteration. And this sophistication we're about to follow, we can trace directly west and go all the way to Atlantis. Now, here we go. First thing I want to point out, I am not the first person to connect bloodlines here. That's not what I'm saying. Archaeologically, I'm, I'm bringing this new. But in terms of Genesis and all the way back to the 16, 1700s, it's been widely discussed, and before that, that it was very known that there was a specific bloodline that populated this region. It was it, That's not new. It's very spelled out. I simply wanted to prove it, and I wanted to prove that there was more to that. And that's where we're going to go from Turkey to back to, back to Iraq through Syria, and then we're going to go right into the Mediterranean. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Kef Kalesi absolutely stunning sight this is a giant rock relief that if you look at if you look at the similarities of this with sumer it's uncanny okay same lion depictions the ancient lion is a symbol of power throughout sumer and egypt as well as turkey but in, at the top look at the pine cone being handed over but instead of a handbag he's a king he's he's passing over kingship in this case and now this god, if you if you go into ancient Armenian and your the Eurasian, you find out his name is God Haldi. Sometimes spelled Kaldi with a K, but God Haldi. And if you look at his descriptions, it's exactly the same as Enlil. Now, what's fascinating about that is that Enlil was the one who came down on Mount Ararat to meet up with Untanapishtim to give him some kind of an agreement. Remember, he gives him the agreement of immortality, but what does he get? I believe he gets the the right to rule this entire region. Here's the proof behind it, because the descriptions and the and, and the depictions of this god Haldi is a war god to create like a powerful empire, and we know the similarities there and how the story goes. It makes total sense. Now let's follow this all the way to the ancient Athenians and all the way to the Atlanteans. This so this depiction shows. He has horns on his helmet. He's passing the pine cone. He's standing on the on the lion, showing power, and he's literally handing down a new kingship empire. That's exactly what this is: a new kingship empire here to create. And and if you look at the top, you see the same depictions we see all the way through these ancient empires throughout history. Welcome to Kef Kalesi. What's above ground? Now, what's fascinating about Kef Kalesi? Go back to here is it's sitting right below a massive volcano, not Mount Ararat, but another volcano called Sufan Dagi that is thir over 13,000 feet high, which is incredible for this region. And so it's no coincidence that Kef Kalesi sits right beneath this volcano, sitting over a massive mountain that looks over this whole lake. Okay. So, so again, we're going to come back to that again. Here's Kef Kalesi. Look at these massive basalt and granite megalithic blocks strewn across this plateau. Yeah. No one's touched anything. Chris, nobody has even done anything here. Is Look at this site. Tell me, in your opinion, doesn't it look like some kind of catastrophe wiped out whatever temple used to be here? Very possible. Highly possible from the looks of this. 
And so what you have is these scattered remains of an ancient, ancient temple site that was dedicated in honor of this god Haldi Enlil in terms of building this empire. But this is just one place. We're gonna let's go underwater to underneath this mountain. Welcome to 2017. Welcome to the underwater ruins of Kef Kalesi as well. So we're looking at a massive complex of temples on the on the mountains and underwater megaliths. Now You'd have to ask that curious question, which researchers did in 2017. How could these ruins be found in the bottom of a massive lake if the civilization is less than 6,000 years old? Right. Doesn't make sense. Hmm. It doesn't. In fact, some have even called this Atlantis mm. in, in, since the article came out. It's not, of course, but it, it ties to it. But more importantly, it proves to us that this civilization is well over 12,000 years old. And if you look at the megalithic blocks in this picture, they match the same architecture that we're about to see in these other sites as well. So this is Kef Kalesi, ancient, uh, ancient kings list coming out of here, showing Haldi hanging down, divine kingship, and these, this empire emerging out of nowhere. Now, welcome to the next site. Now we're at Zernaki Tepe, which is just to the northeast of Kef Kalesi. And in here, and in this site, we see massive polygonal megalithic blocks that look, you might have to do a double take to, to make sure you're not in Peru or in Egypt. Mm. These blocks, and, and, and I want to just use my mouse here if you can see it, this, this block right here on the top right, you can see what looks like some advanced technology and tools used here, like boreholes and, yeah. and cutting up these precise, uh, maybe like a, some kind of a rope system to hold pulleys, like who knows what this is, but. What I want you to see and notice about this is that in Zarkanaki Tepe, just like in Kef Kalesi, we found ancient cuneiform writing, connections to the Sumerian kings, kings lists, just like we see in Sumer, as well as other places. But it's just the tip of the iceberg. This is just one other temple that's connected to Kef Kalesi, one of who knows how many. How many more of these are around this lake that are that are showing us what may have been a population of 50, 100,000 or more, we have no idea. But this is the birthing of discovering an entire advanced civilization. Well, you here. said that the, the the construction was similar to that of what you'd find in Peru. Could it be possible that this was a maritime culture that had the ability to traverse the globe and may have shared the, the, con the constructive abilities? Exactly. That's exactly where I was about to go, Chris. That's why I'm trying to look at the, sh show you these blocks and have them be ingrained into your into your mind. Is that this became the builders? This right is on. the inspiration for where all of Peru, all of Egypt came from. It started here. Okay. Some people might not like that, but remember, when we look into ages, look into Zeptepi in Egypt. We know that we know that that's thirty thousand years ago. That's forty thousand years ago. Atlantis is supposed to be 50,000 years ago, according to the best evidence we have, which is mm -hmm. great, but it's supposed to be arising 50,000 years ago, but we know when it was destroyed from the Egyptians and Plato. We know it was destroyed 11,600 years ago, so we know that, and we know Atlantis, if Atlantis is 50,000 years ago, right, and Egypt is 38,000 years ago, then it means that Egypt, just like Thoth, Thoth says in the Emerald Tablets, it arose out of the destruction of Atlantis. But what came before Atlantis? That's what this whole thing is, is that this is the birthing of a new form of technology, a new form of sophistication that instead of bricks and sumer, all of a sudden we see giant megaliths appearing out of nowhere using basalt and granite and all these hard tool, all these hard materials that we have no idea how they built them. Now, if you look at the bottom left, that's Zernaki Tepe. It's been a tiny little bit has been excavated that you're seeing these pictures, all those squares are all temples. And so it's just the beginning of what this civilization is going to become and how sophisticated it will be. We're going to get even more sophisticated, Chris. You ready? I'm ready. Welcome to oh, wow. Havis Tepe. Now, this has been incorrectly shown online. I've seen it multiple times as being in Peru, which is kind of funny, right? This has actually been shown in like three or four social media posts as being an example of high level sophistication in Peru. Guys, this isn't Peru. This is Kavistefi, Turkey. 
that's why this is so fascinating because it's exactly like something we'd see in Peru or Egypt, yeah. like the Valley Temple in Egypt. Now, it tells you an interesting story, Chris, though. Look, do you see this right here? Yeah, yeah. These are the original basalt blocks of this incredible civilization. These blocks, are you ready for this? These blocks, and it doesn't, there's no other logical thing that we can make sense to this. These are over 50,000 years old. Whoa, wow. How else can we explain it? These blocks are over 50,000 years old. How could that be possible? Basalt and granite is one of the hardest materials on earth. It does not erode, guys. These are built with precision. Now, what happened? Well, the Eurasians, here they are. I didn't say they weren't here. Mm. They're right here. They're right here. They found this. They tried to build around it, on top of it. Yeah. Why are they built underneath it, though, Chris? Why do you think they might have built underneath something that was older? I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to go back as a hint. Right. See that? Yeah. It's it was all in pieces. It. So they tried to exactly. reassemble it. Thank you. Exactly. Mm. They couldn't do it again. They tried. Look, mm -hmm. you guys want to, you guys want to separate our <laughs> timelines. Here. It's right here. It's right, right. here. That's they amazing. tried to mimic it with sandstone guys. This is sandstone or limestone, something softer. This is basalt or granite. They couldn't do this. Not only that, these stones don't even come from here. Who knows where they come from? These stones could come from 500 miles away if, as far as we know. It, the point of, because we know that because of the Aswan core in Egypt, we know that the blocks in the Great Pyramid of Giza, we know that the King's Chamber, the massive um, granite blocks came from 500 miles away in Aswan, Egypt. We know that they were going to do that and they were willing to do that. So that's fine. But it's just interesting because the the other civilizations that came later, the Eurasians, they look at they they're just they were using much softer stone and they tried to mimic it and they just they yeah. couldn't really do it. Wow, that is incredible. Okay. Now this is where it gets even more fascinating. We're gonna add a we're gonna just blow everybody's mind here. You go look up Cavus Tepe. This isn't me. Go look up anything I'm saying right now, please. Go look up Cavus Tepe. You'll learn that it's ruled by King Hake. Go look into King Hake, and he is credited in every resource a researcher as being a direct descendant of Japheth. Japheth, or I'll go back in a second. Japheth, as we have a whole chart coming up in a second, guys. Japheth is one of the direct sons of Noah in Genesis. There's a there's an actual real descendants of Untenapishtim who landed on Mount Ararat, and his sons did go out and literally were descendants throughout the world. But they were done in a way where they're like the great kings and sages that went around and there was like this sacred bloodlines. Is that why there's so much obsession with kings throughout history in these royals? Yeah, I think it is. It's because of all this. Now, this is going to add another layer that's going to blow this, because blow, blow everybody's mind, because I'm going to connect Sumer right here. This is in northern Iraq. Here in northern Iraq, we find a later iteration of sophistication that kind of goes out of nowhere that doesn't look anything like southern Iraq. In, in northern Iraq, near Jerwan, all of a sudden we start seeing megalithic blocks appearing during the time of Sennacherib, who is a lot older than we're told, by the way. He's one of the ancient kings. Um, Sennacherib. And we find these giant megalithic blocks with enormous cuneiform writing, almost like for a giant, right? Look at that person, Chris. This is not an illusion. That is a real picture of a researcher. I've never seen cuneiform writing that large anywhere in the world. Wow. Like it's written for giants. Keep that theme going because we're going to see more examples of that as we go forward. Because we know the sons of these bloodlines were often giants. That's every bloodline throughout history, whether it's Egypt with Akhenaten or they're all elongated heads and ancient bloodlines and genetics that we're going to connect around the world. And we got the evidence for it. Hmm. So here we are in Northern Iraq. And what we have is not only of giant, giant megalithic cuneiform blocks for the first time that had fed down in there from the civilizations of Mount Ararat and the relowering of kingship to Kish, two places at the same time, not one. So an emergence of civilization with Enlil, that's, I want to be clear about that, with Enlil and Mount Ararat and his sons. And then an emergence of civilization again in Sumer through Kish, through Enki, and the bloodlines of that. So there's there's things going on here that are complicated. Mm -hmm. but the point is, you also get the first rock relief anywhere in Iraq. 
that then ends up being what we see in Turkey, in Iran, in Petra Jordan, and in um, Saudi Arabia. It's what I'm saying is the, the large megalithic building sophistication we see, we can trace to Lake Vaughan, as well as the first rock release structures we can trace to the Turkey area in this part of Iraq. Because those two types of architecture, giant rock reliefs in mountains, like in India and in Iran, and giant blocks of stone, polygonal stones, became the two most sophisticated types of building everywhere in the world. That's why I'm trying to point them out, because we're, we're seeing where they be they began right here. So this rock relief on the right is a gigantic, massive cliff, and it's been largely destroyed by war and ISIS and different things over time. But yeah. you can still see, here's King Sennacherib being handed kingship by Enlil and, Nin and, and Ninlo as consort right here. Now look on the left right here, Chris. You see this? Yeah. That's vitrification. That means that this rock melted, huh. proving that this is ancient, ancient, and talking about earth catastrophes. By the way, to melt this rock, which is largely granite-based, again, as I always say, this had to, would have to be temperatures that would exceed 2,000 degrees, which is what wiped these civilizations out. Now, we're going to add more layers to this before we get into bloodlines, because I yeah. want to save that just a bit more. We'll, we'll get there in a second. As we progressed to the to the west and southwest, we see progression of sophistication increase. Welcome to a place that nobody talks about. And it's so sad. You ready for one of the saddest sites, Chris, besides Eridu? Welcome yeah. to Ain, Ain Dara, Syria, destroyed by Turkey bombs in 2018. Oh, man. During the civil war there. Wow. Complete accident. I'm sure they meant to drop those bombs. Oh, yeah, sure. A group of insurgents, and they just accidentally happened to land yeah. on one of the most sophisticated ancient temples in the world. When I've, I've seen those, uh, those deliberate attempts to erase history in the middle east and a lot of those areas i mean there's no doubt that they are intentionally destroying a lot of that stuff that theme is everywhere mm. this history we're doing right now this is what's trying to be wiped out mm. that's what this is now Ain dara in syria most people have never heard of it when they originally discovered it a farmer discovered it because this gigantic basalt line on the right was just sticking his just his head was sticking above the ground and they uncovered it and they realized it was a massive temple but it had some strange attributes to it first of all everything was built in basalt chris remember where we saw the basalt building hmm what about yeah. Abbas Tepe? what about in cave Kef kefkalesi basalt the hardest rock we know mm. and then all of a sudden we see it in syria but we see it in a weird way. We see it building massive lions, which is an, it's an originally a Sumerian symbol. Yeah. But not only that, we see the first place anywhere on Earth with giant footprints. That is not an illusion. Go look up Ain Dara. They created this temple and they actually created intentionally footprints that are enormous. And it's supposedly like it's a temple to the gods. And they that was their footprints. And mm -hmm. this temple was dedicated to Ishtar, and Ishtar becomes a major figure and role in these regions as well as Enlil and Enki. This whole thing is like a battle of ancient gods. It's very interesting to create civilizations. So here's the first one. You see, I just need to point out, some people be like, I don't understand the big deal about this. Basalt's one of the hardest rocks on earth. To create these multi-massive megalithic stones with the tools we're told would have been impossible. And truthfully, we would have trouble in some of these stones today. The precision and, and, and the, the ability for them to do this, we have no idea how they did it. The tools or anything. And that's the that's what I want to echo with all of this. This emergence of this civilization began, it's the beginning of when we became advanced. And let's keep going. Let's go to the next place. As we continue southwest and west, we get to a place called Ebla, Syria. And I've talked a little bit about Ebla, but I want to bring it up again. Now in Ebla... The megaliths are a little bit different, but they're similar. Um, they look like something more like Zernaki Tepe. So there's maybe some influences slightly of different differences, but but they're similar there. In Ebla, we find the primitive work on top, just like we see throughout all. This is all primitive work, by the way, except for right here and right here. Yeah. Right? This is the original remnants of the original temple. 
Mm. This is, and then they, of course, they came later and had other civilizations that built on top of it. But Ebla ended up at this at this time period in history ended up becoming one of the most important and prominent um, trading cities in the world because it's this proximity to the Mediterranean Ocean, Egypt, and Turkey. It was the center of everything, and that's what it became. And it had the second largest library besides the Ashurbanipal Library ever found in the world. The library found at Ebla is, again, I want to reiterate, the second largest library ever found, and it contains cuneiform writings, not only from Assyria, not only from Babylonian, but from Sumerian. And that's important because they're going to see Sumerian had no place here and that it was a later Assyrian civilization. But we have Sumerian writings here. But not only that, Chris, because this is the glue that holds it all together. We have Egyptian writings here. We have Sumerian writings here. And we have the Mount Ararat civilization, which we know as ancient Armenian. That's the writing they used in cuneiform. It's all here. And wow. from Cyprus in the Mediterranean, all of a sudden you see where everything connects is that they had made their way towards the Mediterranean, become more and more sophisticated as they went along. And it gave rise to other civilizations like the pre-classical Greeks, known as the Ionian Greeks or Athenian Greeks. And we'll get into that in a second. But the point is, we have the megaliths here. Look at here's your megaliths. Highly precise, incredible compared to the other stuff. Only in a couple segments and the ancient libraries here that connect it all. Now, wow. again, there's that library I wanted to show for people that want to see it. Because most of these ancient texts haven't even been translated still, like, like the Sumerian stuff. This is what they found, just like the Ashurbanipal Library, another incredible library of ancient knowledge. Who knows what secrets will come out of this one in the future as well. But awesome. it's it's that site where all of a sudden we can connect it. Now, I want to get into where this is like, it starts to make even more sense for people. This is from Isidore's ancient encyclopedia it's like basically a hebrew bible and i know that we have to be careful on religious stuff obviously we know that but we have to still consider the possibility that some of this is true not the dating mm. but some of the other aspects of it and that's what i want people to see this is that this is exactly what we're finding we're three sons of Zayasudra, right shem ham and japheth now remember way back here chris King Hake is considered a son of Japheth. And it just so happens it's right next to Mount Ararat. Completely coincidence, right? And the fact that we see similarities with Enoch in Egypt, and Enoch is supposed to be directly connected to this as well. It's the more you get into this, the more you, you start like scratching your head and be like, well, okay, well, look at this for a minute. So Shem goes to Asia, right? So did, he, is, did Shem... Then he took this rock relief building technology and created all the Indian temples and then all the Southeast Asian temples and then created Lemuria Mu. Is, is that possible? And then Japheth moved west through Europe and goes from Turkey and creates the ancient Athenians and they eventually become the, the Atlanteans. And then look at look at um, Cham, Ham, you know, Cham or Ham, depending on your pronunciation, goes down and eventually creates Egypt and the Dogon and king atlas and maritania and there's something going on here chris yeah. there's something going on here because it can't be a coincidence that that these areas are like divine direct connections to the ancestry of untinapishtim and all of these bloodline kings now let's take it another step further this map was already created showing that it looks exactly like the way these structures were built chris look the area is in red sons of japheth Here's oh. the Black Sea. Here's Mount Ararat. Look, it's his territory. Look yeah. at Africa, Ham's territory with Egypt. But look at this. Look at Shem, right down through the Persian Gulf. And this whole, it's like exactly the way it's we see it depicted in these. Uh, and then what we're going to do here is I want to then expand on this right here. This map on our right. Now imagine... If we read Plato's description of the Timaeus and Critias with Atlantis, you find that Atlantis had a rival civilization known as the Athenians. And that's going to, that's going to be in the new season that I am so excited, guys. We do see how much work we put into this. But the new season of ancient civilizations is going to go into territory it never has. We're going to break open this entire war. The ancient Athenian civilization that's never talked about. The point is, its patron god is Enlil, Zeus, right? 
It's the same movement west, west from Japheth's sons and Enlil being the patron god in creating the megalus. We find the same megalus in ancient Greece, guys, Delphi, the Oracle of Delphi, the stories there, all of it connects is that what we find is that all of a sudden megaliths appear in Western Turkey too. Mm. And we see these demigods and these rulers like King Midas in the Phygrian Valley. And as we move into Anatolia with Sam Simeon and Gobekli Tepe, guys, that's where it comes from. It starts spreading west and it goes all the way down through Syria, northern Ir Iraq, Iran, and it gets in the Mediterranean and it creates the Ionian and Athenian Greeks and they become incredibly sophisticated for their level. And then it moves out, but it doesn't go directly west from here. And, I, and it's, this is, of course, a whole other slideshow we can get into. But what it looks like more so is that Enlil and his sons and this civilization, Mount Ararat, perfected themselves in Greece. They stopped. That was there. That was where they went to create their perfected civilization. And at the same time, because we find the megaliths there, guys, too, on the bottom most levels. It's right there. But at the same time, something else happened. Atlantis isn't described as starting from the Greeks. It's not described as that at all. It's described as being Egyptian. And it's described as being African. Because when we go to Mauritania in Western Africa, you find the Atlas Mountains and the sons of Atlas became the great ancient kings of Atlantis with Poseidon. So what does that mean? It means that Enlil and Japheth took Europe and the Mediterranean for their civilization with Ishtar. Their civilization and Enki and other sons, like Thoth, they, they traveled in Africa. And Egypt, of course, may have been created many times. We have no idea how many times that's been started. But they went through Africa. And I think that's where the whole story of the Dogen comes in. The Dogen meeting Oannes, this whole idea of this aquatic being that teaches them about Sirius and all this stuff. It's because they were traveling through Africa and creating all these things. So they created Eventually, you know, Egypt, uh, the land of Kem, and then the Dogon, and then the ancient kings of Mali. Mali and Mauritania. Mauritania became the launching pad for when the sons of Atlas then created Atlantis. And that's, it came off of the offshoot of here. And that's why we see such African influences with the Olmec in Mexico, because this essentially the Olmec are like the Dogon. It's it's all there as a migratory route of great sages and kings to create what would eventually become the lost legendary civilizations of Atlantis and Lumur Lemuria. Oh. But I believe they all came from the Ararat civilization and the Sumerians. And that's I believe that's how it spread around the world to create this incredible sophisticated chapter of civilization from Peru and Egypt all the way up through the Atlanteans and Athenians and the Sumerians and the Iranians and up in the Persians again and up into Turkey. And they were all wiped out, Chris. They were all wiped mm. out. And that was a chapter that like we largely think is a myth and we have trouble connecting, I believe. This is incredible, Matt. This is amazing the connections you've made with this now i want to go back for a second to the gods and your understandings of who or what these beings were you were saying that the the kingship and the knowledge was handed down from above now does this mean the gods came from somewhere else or were they just advanced more robust larger human beings that had advanced consciousness abilities and knowledge or yeah. were they actually from somewhere else coming here giving us this this advanced knowledge and abilities this has been probably the hardest question in my life chris and because i have read more ancient tablets than i know of than anyone and i have looked and just obsessed over anything that talks about origins of the anuna anything relating to anything that they have in there right and the only thing that makes sense is the way that george smith describes it george smith was the first assyriologist he was like honestly one of my greatest heroes and the greatest heroes of mankind that hasn't been properly identified he was the first person to break the sumerian code meaning sumerian was a dead language that had died out for thousands of years and nobody left alive knew how to speak it that's what's so fascinating about it is it truly is the alien language we've been looking for. It's Sumerian. It's a language isolate, which means it doesn't share any similarities with any of the other languages on Earth. Meanwhile, ancient Armenian is the core root language that then eventually became the Greeks in a lot of the Turkish languages. 
So there's another layer there for you to consider is that the Armenian highlands, Mount Ararat, is the birthplace of that language that then spread out throughout Europe. Hmm. Now, to get into your answer, George Smith he was like a master at understanding the ancient world and the, and the ancient Sumerians. And he translated more texts than anyone in his time. He was the first. And he he once said at the end of the Chaldean account of the Chaldean account of Genesis, that he all he could figure out is that the Anunnas seemed to be beings that came from before and then later in different time periods of, of our history to make specific contributions here for a reason. One of them being creating civilization here and creating us and other things being potentially even like stabilizing and creating the world as we know it today. And I know that's an extremely difficult thing to wrap your head around, but we have to understand that the more you dig into this and the depths of how the obsession over these kings and the obsession over the gods that then appointed them and how the, the obsession over these bloodlines, and we're not even done yet, Chris, I have a couple more slides. Yeah. But the obsession over that is real. And it's because it comes from a place that we've forgotten. We've forgotten that we are gods. We are them. And we have forgotten that that is this legacy that we're that we're missing. Now, Chris, where do they come from? As far as I can tell, they are they may be some of the most powerful beings in the universe and they likely came from another universe. It's that's all I can say. It's like beyond my comprehension because they seem to be omnipotent and and nothing is beyond their power. They talk about creating entire like moving planets and creating an entire um um ecosystems and things like that in the enuma elish it's bizarre they seem to take an interest in the natural world and they seem to be battling against the chaos of the natural world hmm. it's echoed that throughout history that they want something to be in a certain way but something is chaotic and can't support life in a certain way so they alter it interesting it's very i think yeah. we should my my la i guess what i want to say chris is Based on what I've studied, I think we need to change the narrative a little bit and start never start underestimating how powerful we are and how powerful this whole story is and how it connects to them. This it's all we're all connected. We are them, they are us. Our stories are interchanged. But I want to give you the genetic proof, Chris. Yeah. Because when I, I fine, there are gonna be people right now that just listen to this, so like, I don't believe it still. I don't believe it. Atlanteans were created by a space force that came down. I don't believe it. Okay, fine. But how about this? We find this very similar architecture in other parts of the world as we just showed you in Turkey and other places, right? In Egypt and other areas. But we also find proof of it being connected. The proof is besides the stories of the ancient ancient Peruvians and Inca saying that Viracocha was their great sage, and that besides the similarities of Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl to the Aztec and Maya, let's just put those aside for a second, who are all the same, by the way. Besides that, we'll be fine that a wonderful man researching named Brian Forrester, who has spent a lot of time, along with Gaia, studying the skulls of Paracas, Peru. Chris, you've, I'm sure you remember these, right? Oh, yeah. I've interviewed Brian before. Yeah. Skulls of Paracas, Peru are bizarre number one they're elongated and number two they've done genetic testing on them and the results came back shocked everyone the genetic testing for the paracas skulls came back for being from the caucus black sea area of near mount ararat in turkey that's where the genetics came from for peru is the exact area of mount ararat yeah. civilization there it is i'm people want to bring um alternative theories for that or challenge me how else can you explain it we see the exact same architecture same gods same influences and we have genetic testing that proves that it came from that same area not only that chris in malta malta is located here i'll go back here malta is located here in malta in the hippogeum known as the oracle chamber we found elongated skulls there as well that also are genetically traced to the Caucasus Mountains Black Sea of Turkey. Same thing. So we have the genetic the genetic traits in the Mediterranean for the ancient Athenians, as well as the Peruvian and, and the traits here that we know are part of the Atlantean civilization. So we're we're piecing this story together, Chris, and we're bringing it back. And, and we're almost done. We have two slides left. Mm. This is just a quick little thing to show. Look, our earth goes through catastrophes. 
cyclical catastrophes that are on a scale we can imagine. That's why these these ruins are destroyed. Some are underwater. Some are sunken. Some are just gone forever. It's because our Earth has gone through traumatic, tremendous, kind of apocalyptic changes. And it's wiped these stories out. And in many cases, if they were written on paper and they weren't written in Q&A form, they would have never survived. So that's why there's so little left. We have to wrap our heads around how volatile the Earth's history is. Now, last slide, Chris, just to sum the, just to get the whole thing for people to wrap their heads around. Um, I had instinctively, not instinctively, I should say, but when I created this timeline a long time ago, I had put all of these ancient Sumerian stuff before 50,000 and people thought I was crazy, but it turns out this was right. Now I have the Atrahasis written here because I think this is when it was written, but it's a story that came from here. Now that's how this whole thing fits in, in my opinion. Uh, if I was going to move one thing in here, Chris, I might move Kish back up over here. Hmm. I I would I might move I'm I'm starting to lean on moving Kish and some of these a little bit older. I think this could adjust a bit. I think some of these things might be able to be moved around. Um, but largely this is something I want people to wrap their heads around to encompass what I just talked about. Um, to get a better understanding of how these rises and falls seem to happen. Um, but to make it very clear, just to point out younger Dryas catastrophes don't even seem to be related to the original Sumerian stories at all. It seems to be a much earlier event. And I know that some people have pointed that out and I appreciate them saying that turns out they were right. So that's what we're looking at. Chris is that we are uncovering an entire connection to a lost chapter in human history for the first time showing evidence in genetic testing to back up the whole story, to recreate our past, to, to finally understand the struggles, the triumphs we've gone through, to lead us to where we are, to re remember how incredible we once were and how incredible we can be again. I love it, man. And I, I loved looking back at where you've come from, from our first shows that we did together until the time that you first started this timeline until now. You've done such incredible work and you've brought so much to the table. It, it truly is changing history, Matt. I want to thank you so much for all the work you've done. This is incredible. Before we close out, what can we look forward to? You said you've got some, some things coming out on Gaia. Yeah. Um, the new season of Ancient Civilization Season 5 is going to have a whole host of some of these topics. I'm bringing a lot of this new knowledge into that. So just get excited, guys, because this is going to be an incredible season, as well as the new, um, the new book I'm writing. I have decided to make a huge focus of that book be this. So what it's going to be is the new book is going to be more like um, I'm changing the title around to, to incorporate the dead binary star with... Um, the the connection of catastrophes and how Sumer connects to Atlantis. So I want to tell this story, how catastrophes have destroyed them, introduce the whole alternative hypothesis of the binary star influence with these catastrophes. Um, so that'll be something that is not a, an easy little task to take yeah. on. But as we go forward, Chris, I want to present this again, and I want to make this established and really get this thing moving uh, forward and continue adding more discoveries and more connections to it. Yes, definitely. I love it, Matt. This is incredible. We'll definitely have to do this as you come up with more information and research, and we'll do it again soon. And before you head out, let everyone know where they can find your work, the best way to access your stuff, and social media, all your good stuff. Thanks, Chris. Um, guys, if you want to check out my work and you're interested in more, please check out my website, thestageoftime.com, as well as my YouTube channel, Matthew LaCroix, and I'm on Instagram at thestageoftime. And we got a lot of exciting things to come. And I just want to give one last announcement for people that are asking. Um, we had some unfortunate delays on the Epic of Humanity, but it is going to ship soon, I promise, guys. It's supposed to ship in June and at the latest July. So look for that coming soon, and then we can move forward on some other exciting new things, all right? Don't Excellent. don't miss that book, guys, because it's gonna have it's the most ancient text, even more than the stage of time. It is your library of of ancient knowledge. I love it, man. My brain's about to leak out of my ears right now. This is so exciting. Matt, we'll do this again soon. And until next time, everyone, have an excellent evening. We will talk again on Sunday. We'll see y'all then. Exactly.